Hey, welcome to Academy of Tone 184. Tonight we are talking about the Marshall JTM 45. And in the intro song we could hear my beloved JTM 45, all original from 1965. And the one that Marshall just uh, released, um, the JTM Studio, which is, um, well, kind of a modern incarnation of that classic, iconic Marshall amplifier that started the rock and roll. This amp is kind of, well, on the tr transition from blues to rock. Um, Jim Marshall copied, actually, uh, a 59 baseman with the components of the stuff that was available in the UK back in the 1960s, early 60s. Actually, <clears throat> the first prototype was built in 1962 and the first production um, models that looked similar to this um, studio with the coffin logo, <laughs> which is, um, you know, the first logo of Marshall. Um, um, has been out with this kind of cosmetics and looks. Mine from 1965 already features the later Marshall logo, the so-called script logo, not the block logo. Um, yeah, and the third amp, which I also played um, when I showed you um, with my hands what I was playing was of course the amp one. And as you could hear, they are all three different and the question is, what is actually different on all these three amps? And the point here is, what's so special about the JTM45? Well, maybe we should look into the schematics first, because that tells kind of where the whole thing is coming from. On the top, we can see the Fender Bassman 5F6A, which is the 59 Bassman as we know it, one of the holy grail blues amplifiers. Um, that amp usually came, <coughs> well, it came in that uh, 4x10 combo format. And these amps were loved by guitar players, even though they were designed for bass players, um, but they had that nice dark tone that um, was fat in a way and when there was not enough product um, to to import from overseas from Fender uh, clever Jim Marshall came up with the idea of simply copying it and looking at the schematics of both amps we can see the similarities and the differences actually looking at the schematic the only real difference are the three resistors um, we can see on the lower uh, schematic which are encircled red and these are resistors that are responsible for getting the tubes which are different tubes in the Marshall versus the Fender working properly. So on the Fender Bassman, we have 606 or 5881 tubes, 5881 tubes. And in the JTM45, we have KT66 or EL34 tubes. Mine has KT66 and I learned the hard way that you have to get the real good or original General Electric's, uh, the old one, new old stock tubes. Uh, this amp doesn't sound right with anything else. Um, the magic is kind of lost when you go and change the tube on that particular amp. Um, yeah, maybe it's also interesting to look a little bit about the musical side and the history of that amp. Um, you know, people like um, Pete Townsend of The Who, whose father was playing with Jim Marshall in a band, was interested in more volume and therefore the JTM45 was coming also with the first 4x12 cabinets. Um, so this was defining a new level of volume. 
<clears throat> so volume was the key back in the days and of course a full and rich tone and the bassman was known to be that full and rich because bass um, yeah um, and then I think the 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 biggest change in rock music was Eric Clapton using a JTM 45 um, in a combo format 212 uh, on the Bino album with John Mayle, um, the the Blues Breaker album, and because it's in, it's the Blues Breaker album with the Bino uh, comic on the front, and on that particular album, Eric. Um, had some arguments in the studio because the engineer, the recording engineer, told him to turn down and he refused to do that because we all know if he had done that, we never had rock music like we, like we hear it today. We would have probably a nice and clean country blues sound, but not a rocky sound. And this is um, the starting point of modern rock tone. That's one of the biggest achievements that I have to credit to Eric Clapton um, that he has done this in a way to have that elegant phrasing coming from the blues combined with that elegant tone of that original um, JTM 45. So it's, it's historically um, speaking a very important amp in the history of guitar amplification. Um, if the world would be stuck on Fender basements, basements, it, it was we would wouldn't have the rock like it is. So the the four by twelve that came on later with the Who and then Jimi Hendrix using um, a GTM forty five but with two output transformers with even more volume like hundred watt GTM forty five uh, 45 100 um, that was set the benchmark for a different experience are you experienced sound back in the 60s and that took the sound of rock to the really new level and now Marshall reissuing their uh, classic M's they have done a JCM 800 and uh, the the GMP um, and now this is the GTM um, they are going back into their own history which is kind of important because uh, it's part of rock history and this is something that I really respect a lot um, and I love Marshall Amps as you can see from what's sitting behind me <coughs> um, when, when we look at this amp here, it has the total original cosmetics, which is killer. I mean, it's something that uh, speaks to me in a way of uh, a nice piece of furniture for your living room. Um, it's so 60s. And anal analyzing where it's all coming from, this is kind of suitcase making with the uh, golden um, pipe piping I think it's called uh, you see on mine original it's even nicer because the gold actually shines and on on the new one it's 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 brown it's not really gold um, but anyway it, it, it's still so cool looking um, I believe that's super important yeah and Marshall brought out these classic heads in the studio version since times are changing and people are requesting less powerful amps these days. Um, back in the 60s, it was about volume, it was about being heard, and now it is about the tone, and it's about not being too loud since we have uh, decent PA systems these days. But I personally still believe that playing a real amp is a very important experience for being an electric guitar player. To me, playing the electric guitar with a real tube amp 
is something like playing an acoustic drum kit, not playing a electronic drums. Um, that might sound great for the audience, but it's a different feel once you played it. And to have that tube amp experience, I'm happy that Marshall released these amps. So uh, let's hear. So this is the studio. And the setting is presence all the way up, bass on four, uh, middles on six, treble on six, and uh, I'm using the high treble input full and the other one kind of somewhere. I noticed that on this amp, the um, influence is there. Maybe you can listen. There's a touch more volume when you put the normal volume in the middle. And that's also the same with the original amp. So something must be kind of similar on these amps. Um, yeah, for what it is, it's pretty okay concerning the weight. It's a head, it looks cool. It has all the features that you expect from the old amp. But it also has a few features that are new. So this amp has, uh, besides all the traditional stuff on the front panel, um, there's a switch, the standby switch, which can be high power and low power. The, the tube, um, the 5881 tubes deliver 20 watts <coughs> on this amp, but they can also switch to, I think it's five power, uh, five watts output power. So that makes it nicer in a way. Um, and it has an effects loop. Effects loop is, of course, not available on the original because effects were not even invented by then. <laughs> Where is my pedal delay? There was no pedal. There was only a fuzz pedal that you could put in front of the amp. So there was no need for an effects loop and nobody ever thought about effects loop. That came like almost 10 years later. Um, but these days we want to have our reverb or we want to have a delay pedal basically in the effects loop as we learned that the effects sound cleaner when the, when the effects are in an effects loop. Um, and that comes from the background of the preamp does some distortion and the power amp also does some dis dis distortion, especially what I do now with the, the high treble input cranked all the way. This one is on max, like 10. Um, and this is what it sounds like. Now I can use the guitar in the traditional way, <laughs> crank the amp and have the volume on the guitar low. pickup, volume on the guitar, that's all I was dialing. And there's no channel switching, there's no nothing. That is the old school tone and that's the old school magic of playing the electric guitar. Uh, a lot of people forgot about that because they recall their presets and they have whatever sound, like instant, and, but they don't have to work the tone. It's like... Yeah, 
it's right here on the volume um, control. So I'm happy that this amp hits the market because now <coughs> even younger players who have not the budget to buy one of those original or big old amps can have a piece of history in their living room or wherever practice room and experience the electric guitar as it was, which I find totally fascinating. Okay, um, besides the effects loop, we also see a DI out. I'm not sure if this is any cool sounding recording out. It's a DI out. Maybe it's useful um, in case you want more power since this amp is only 20 watts to have another extension power amp to make it like loud as the big boys. Um, yeah, it has five speaker outs um, and yeah, it, it has the vintage specs, but now I'm talking about the differences. The Studio JTM by Marshall, the reissue has no rectifier tube. Talking about the real old JTM 45s, they use tube for rectifier, for the rectifier stage to make AC into DC. <clears throat> and now I show you what the difference is. This was the modern. Okay, sounds cool. This is the old one. to the reissue. And back to the old one. Hmm, there's some differences here. Um, what is the difference? It is fuzzier in a way, but it's also changing a lot of the overtones when I go through the spectrum um, of dynamics, playing soft, playing a little bit harder, playing even harder and then have it like full on. And I can use that spectrum for my expression as a musician. I can make the, the notes sing more. I can have that fuzzy low end in a way. <clears throat> and that is partially or mainly coming from the rectifier tube because the rectifier tube on the original one um, changes the voltage because it's spongier compared to a diet rectifier or silicon rectifier in the reissue and therefore the tone is squashier but also the the sound changes through its dynamics so just yeah see what's what's going on here <laughs>
try the same on the reissue. dig in it doesn't have that extra zagging and that's part of the rectifier tube magic to me <clears throat> i can hear a similar effect even on the fender basement if you play the fender basement um, that also features a rectifier tube and that's kind of the magic now i'm cranked all the way up so i'm having this to the most extreme a lot of players use this like more as a clean um, or on the edge of breakup or breakup platform uh, in combination with pedals, which is also great. But that extra that we get from that on the edge and the breakup, and the more you go into there, even if you sometimes just touch it, gives you more feel expression opportunities if you have those and that's something that was fascinating myself so much that i actually bought these amps and <clears throat> the behavior of that jtm 45 to me is so special that besides all my other marshals <laughs> i had to get that real deal and i was on a hunt for it for many many years i had a reissue and i was not happy i had to find an original and then I, in the end I had to find the original tubes to get it uh, to the right um, point. Okay, talking about uh, the new studio, um, there is no dummy load which means you always have to have a speaker connected to it even though uh, you have the eye out and even though um, you have a low power mode. So it's not a, a silent recording amp but it gives you the option what I have done low power and squeezed all the way to get at least in the direction of those historic amps. But there's the difference between nice okay-ish reissues and the real deal. And of course uh, that amp is affordable and the real deal not. <laughs> First, you have to find one, and second, <laughs> you pay a shit's load of money. And of course, there are uh, like some that you can tweak and find that are pretty good, but it's a job. If you go into a shop and buy a new amp, this one is like out of the box consistent and gives you some of um, those nice features. Okay, um, finally, let's compare this to the amp one um, we are on the studio now on the amp one okay forget about the effects The original old one. And the M1. Well, I personally believe that the M1 is even closer to the old one than the reissue. Um, why? Um, I'm using the power soak and I'm using um, actually no gain reduction, just the power soak and crank the master volume a little bit to have saturation for my power amp stage in combination with some um, overdrive from the pre amp stage. And that already um, I believe is closer to what's happening on this original. 
if I want to get even, even closer, I have to have a little bit more base. So I'm using a TC electronic spark booster, everything in the middle. So there is no extra trouble. There is no extra. It's, I just crank a little bit the base. And the reason why I do that is <clears throat> the original 45 has a pretty flat bass response. And even though I don't have the bass all the way up, it's on four, um, the bass is more than on a modern 800 or other amps like a super lead. And therefore, I just use that pedal and we can have a listen on how that would sound with more or less bass. Okay, amp one as it is, sounds like this. <laughs> Now with more bass. I mean, it still cleans up and does all these beautiful things. It has that extra fuzzy low end. Back to the original. Of course, there is still some magic here. And back to the M1. I would say it's a pretty good fake, but it's not exactly what's happening on the original one. The overtones are different. And guess what? With the new Amp X, we go all the way and we recreated exactly what's happening in that JTM 45. There's a little video that shows the proof. Watch it. This is the world famous JTM 45. Um, yeah, and this is an X. <laughs> Yeah, for me, <laughs> um, you know, the MX platform gives me um, the opportunity to go into these details. And that's why it takes so long. And I am still not finished at this point in time. Because um, if you discover the details of some of the iconic amps, and I have to go through all the genres, I'm talking about these old non-master volume amps, but I also have to talk about uh, modern high gain amps and anything in between um, to recreate the original tones. It's a challenge and you could hear that on the studio, which is pretty okay, but I'm not happy with okay. I want to go, <laughs> I want to go all the way anyway. Um, so what, what is, for me, what is the lesson? I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we see the issues of historic amps because that makes it worth um, going to a music store, getting the experience, and hopefully some younger guys will check that out because whatever dad or granddad <laughs> was listening to the Beano album and they are getting kind of curious what was going on when 
uh, in the wild 60s. Um, and it is, it is important that we do care about the tone culture in a way. Otherwise, the excitement of the electric guitar with all the tones that you can do um, will, will die. And um, having a few presets on modelers also helps. But I, I, I truly believe that um, the, the quality of analog amps like this one or like the original or like amp one is a different experience um, in the feel when you play the instrument. And that belongs into my world and hopefully it helps other people also to improve their tone because everybody says tone is in the hands but you have to have the right tools also to create a good tone. Once you've been there you can transfer that great tone to anything. I can sound great on a modeler as well but I learned it the hard way on non-master volume marshals and I was torturing the world with it because of that dynamic experience but it's now memorized as a tone in my head and that's something every note that I play still reflects those early thoughts and feelings how to to play the note in a way that it's actually sounds well like a singer trains his voice so I was training you know the tone on the fretboard and it's still there whatever I play you know even if I play something that is not whatever my favorite or whatever I still have that tone and it's muscle memory that I learned creating the tone it's like... I can recreate that great tone that I learned on my JTM45 playing my M1. So, yeah, that's where I learned it. And by the way, if you ever have the chance to visit Milton Keynes in the UK, go and visit the Marshall factory. I have a few pictures uh, when I've been there. Uh, seeing, see where I was standing? That's the first all original JTM 45 um, built, I think, in 1962, a pre-production model they had there. It's not exactly the one on this picture, but the one I was standing next to it. Um, yeah, that's that's so cool. Um, doing yeah, this is the this is the chassis. See, <clears throat> aluminium chassis. Wow, that's the one. Okie doke. Um, yeah, in the next part, we have the news of a few of our friends and M1 users and players. Young Andrew Matthews from Portland, USA, has a lot of news for you guys as he is touring, constantly touring, recording and doing new stuff. Check that out. And after this, we will see our German hard rock maniacs from Mad Max that just have uh, finished a South um, Latin America tour, which um, 
yeah, it's also great. Of course, they all play M ones. And uh, it's good to know that you can travel light these days with an M1, being it a Mercury or Iridium edition. So um, a lot of user feedback that makes me happy. Okie doke, enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to have him again after two years, Andrew Matthews from Portland in the USA. Hello. Hey. How have you been? I've been very good. I've been very, very busy. I can tell because I'm following you on all the, you know, social media, Instagrams and stuff. And you've been posting many things, gigs like crazy just lately. Uh, it looks like you're putting together a tour. What's going on? It does look like a tour, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, since we last spoke, I've joined, well... I've joined a few bands and I started a couple. So, yeah, I'm just so busy with gigs in the Portland area and sli mm -hmm. slightly larger reaching out. So, yeah, lots of gigs. So, so the first band we talked about two years ago was the Rolling Tones, kind of a Rolling Stones tribute band. Yeah. This was kind of your first band. That, and yeah. Is this band still going on or what happened to that band? It is going on. The, the thing is that it's seven musicians, so it is kind of hard to get all of us, all of our schedules to align and do gigs. Yeah. So we tr so we don't gig a whole lot, but we try to make you know, make them special, yeah. good gigs. Yeah, I I have a, a formed my own three piece band because I found out after having such big lineups, you know, with so many people, it's not only getting the The, the guys on board and every uh, you know every schedule uh, matching it's also kind of how much money do we actually make when we play somewhere yeah. and it's it's like traveling um, means also you need whatever seven hotel rooms and you need a, a bigger you, you can't go with your private car anymore you have to hire a bus and all that kind of logistics yeah. it, it explodes and um, so that band is still going on. Okay, cool. What other bands have you been uh, forming since then? Yeah, so that was 2021. Also that yeah. year I formed the Andrew Matthews Band. So that is also a three-piece, actually. And that ah, is my three. original band. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you just recorded an album with that band, right? I did. I just did earlier this year. <laughs> my... My first album, so, yeah. Yeah. For, for me, this was very impressive because, um, you know, a lot of players these days, they just do social media stuff, Instagram and, and something, and they, they don't really go for a full album. And the way you do it seems to be a little old school, but feels very right to me because making an album is making a statement it's like yes. hey guys that's that's me that's my music that's my songs um that's you know it's a personal thing even if if you're not making big money at the beginning uh, and even the biggest rock stars never did at the beginning you know there's yeah. so many stories you can hear that they nearly went broke even kiss and van halen and whatnot and and it was starting kind of with their first record slow and then suddenly sometimes magic happens and they become uh, known widely um, and getting bigger in a way. So to do such an album at your age and yeah. in these days for me is a big, big, big statement. So f f all my respect for that. I mean, killer. Um, Have you been the songwriter I have you, or have you collaborations with the other guys in the band or how does the songwriting process went? So yeah, guys? yeah, the, I am the uh, songwriter on the album. I completely wrote the entire album myself, right where I'm sitting actually. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would record demos for songs. I would get riff ideas, lyric ideas and record them right here with you know the amp one, my blue box. <laughs> and mm -hmm. record them into Logic Pro. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'd, I'd use like drum programs to sort of get my ideas out 
fully yeah. visualize how I want the song to be. And so then I could send these demos to the band. And then they'd right. come down here. They'd learn them. We'd play them live. And mm -hmm. yeah, it w we would refine it from there. We, we would, you know, practice them, rehearse them over and over again, play them live, yeah. see how they went with audiences, see what needs to change. And that's sort of how the album developed. And yeah. yeah. Guess, guess what I'm doing right now here? You see my laptop in the corner? Yeah. This is my recording setup as well. Again, MP1, Blue Box, and this is what I'm using on my next album which will be released so, uh, with with a friend of mine uh, Ben Granfeld from uh, Finland yeah. we will do kind of a twin guitar thing two guitars with a lot of harmony parts and things like that awesome um, yeah and this is actually being recorded here we we went to the studio for the basic tracks with the drummer and the bass and um, we, we did a similar process of writing songs I wrote some songs he wrote some songs And a few, we, we had some ideas and met in the studio and then, you know, worked it out with the bands like, okay, no, had a little um, um, experimentational bits here and there besides the well-structured songs that we prepared uh, before we went uh, to the studio. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm, I'm doing some, you know, redo the, the guitar tracks properly because... Uh, Yeah, when when we all play together, there's one track I left all original, no overdubs, because it felt right and it was the right energy. But of course, on the rest of the the, the songs, in the very moment you write the song, uh, you are not focused on playing your best. Right. And then, yeah. So this is why I'm not cheating, but it's it's like okay, I I re-record some of the tracks again and. Uh, refine the arrangement and I guess this is what you have done as well yeah something similar um, I actually ended up using a lot of the demo tracks on the final songs just because mm -hmm. you know I've got the blue box I've actually recorded with two inputs I would use the blue box and I've got a, yeah. a 412 Marshall cabinet back there so I would mm -hmm. um, have, yeah, have two inputs that I could blend like in stereo and just layer tracks Um, I would record it to the SM57, you know, basic, yeah. but sounds really good. It, it fits, you know, really well with the blue box signal. So yeah. that's how I would, rec I would, I would just record that for the demo. Just so if it's good enough, then why not have it on the album? I, I mean, this combination is a classic. It's been proven to work for decades yeah. and, uh, Actually, I'm doing the same, but for me, it's I'm getting lazy. I just use the blue box. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> In the studio, when we recorded with the band, I actually had my cabinet mic'd up uh, with a, a large, uh, whatever, big diameter microphone to get some extra different tones just in case. Yeah. And, and then w when we started to have the first song, kind of a test mixing, Then they don't even use it anymore. So, you know, I, I, I have my setting here, then I can drop in any time, you know, in case somebody wants a, something to be changed. It's like, ah, you know, Ben is moaning about uh, you play too fast. Yeah. I can't keep up <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> but it's like may, maybe we, we change that line here and there yeah. and then it's, uh, it's something... Um, I can simply drop in and ch exchange it and have the same tone. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's something uh, good about a setup that, that you don't change, which you know, sits there and is, um, well, you can go back for your original sound. Um, also, you told me about a new project, which is um, like Jimmy Page tones yeah. when uh, Led Zeppelin. W w what's about that? Is this a new band? This is, well, actually, it's not a new band, but I am new to this band. This, it's called okay. Valhalla. It's a tribute mm -hmm. to Led Zeppelin. And so they've been around for about 10 years, and I just, um, I am the newest guitarist in the band. I am blonde Jimmy Page. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that is a lot of fun because all that those Zeppelin riffs and solos, that, that pretty much taught me how to play guitar when I was starting out. So yeah. it was a lot of material that I had to have ready, but it really wasn't that hard because I knew a lot of it already. That was the same for the Rolling yeah. Tones. You know, these are classic yeah, songs. Yeah. I already know this stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I fit right in, and we, yeah, we do some some really good paying gigs, great big concerts. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm my, myself. I'm also a big, big Led Zeppelin fan. You know, it's like if if you listen to some of the um, classic songs. Um, I mean, everybody knows "Whole Lot of Love." You know, it's like uh, like. <laughs> The question is, do we do it with all downstrokes or with alternate picking? It's like, you know. I, I can do both, but on the other hand, it's like, hmm, original, not original. Right. Usually, usually I do alternate picking because it's, I'm cheating. I think the original way is downstrokes only. Do you have a preferred way of doing this, of, of playing it? I've never thought about it that much, but I think I probably <laughs> alternate pick it. Yeah, I definitely alternate pick that. And for, say, for the guitar say, players out there, we need to make sure we get this riff right. Yeah. Where you, when you're playing the D note, you, ha you got to play the D fretted, but also the open string and b like bend it just slightly. <laughs> Exactly, because that makes that. Uh, otherwise, it is sounding too clean. Yeah, you know, it's um, and and Zeppelin sometimes is about um, stuff not being a hundred percent in pitch. Yes, and that makes the sound of the band special and e sometimes even wider. It's like when you use a chorus pedal, what you have is a pitch change on top of a correct pitch. Yeah, and so. It, if you have like two strings, like the open D string and a fretted D at the same time at band one, you have a chorus effect. Mm -hmm. And the chorus makes a wide sound. And Jimmy Page is a, is a very smart guy. I'm, uh, yeah. And all, all his arrangements, I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan of this, you know? Yeah. Um, do you know that song? Uh, uh, what is it? What, what, what it should be? Uh, you know, there's a. Do you say to you? There's uh, several ways of playing that there. Um, yeah. And then there's a... Yeah. Yeah. That's a fun and song. I love that slide do, guitar do solo. Even... Yeah. I grabbed the slide so for that. You... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, super cool. So, slide is how how have you been playing slide before that band, or is this on? Is this a thing that you already did a lot in the past, or is this a kind of new? No, I've I've always played slide. It's definitely great for yeah blues stuff. I think uh, a guy Rory Gallagher is very influential in my slide playing. <laughs> Just really, just energetic. Just you know, the, like lots of vibrato. Going. I love yeah. that stuff. So yeah, we, his we have playing. A, yeah, we have a we have a lot of Rory Gallagher stories. He is a guy from Ireland, um, and he used to play Germany a lot because back in the whatever seventies, eighties, um, the Germans loved you know the rock and roll from the. Yeah, from the UK and from the United States. Yeah. And R Rory was a very intensive player and a very energetic guy. And we had a TV program called the Rock Palace. Yes. Uh, yeah. And that's a, you know, it, it made a lot of people famous. And we Germans were totally focused on watching the Rock Palace because the bands being on the Rock Palace were kind of very good choices first. The guys, wh whoever was organizing that stuff, was knew what was good. Yeah. And 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 then the the artists coming to this kind of show, they knew also if you perform your ass off in that show, <laughs> you 
you can tour Germany easily. And Rory did did it right. It, he, he did it totally right. And um, I have seen Rory a, a few times here in the area, actually, wow. uh, playing big festivals, smaller things. And I mean, this guy was always on fire. Unbelievable. Yes. No? Uh, he, he was giving 150%. I mean, more than you would expect. And um, we have, by the way, we have a, a blue guitar artist um, who is in the band of friends. Yeah. Uh, R Rory Gallagher's bass player and drummer, kind of. And, and uh, he's, he's playing that music uh, these days. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. It all goes round in circles. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a ton of those Rock Palace videos. Those are so good. It's, yeah, several Rory Gallagher ones. Yeah, de definitely a lot yeah. of inspiration there. Yeah, Rory is just a huge inspiration for me. Yeah, that energy on stage, that intensity in his playing, and just uh, like those like those little pinch harmonic. <laughs> just really exciting playing, and that is just huge influence on me. Did I ever tell you the story? I actually did play with the band of friends once. Did I ever tell oh, you? Oh, really? No, yeah. and I, I've never heard that. No? So, Jerry McEnroy, what, what's his name? The bass yeah. player? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, was, yeah. it was with um, this guy named Davey Knowles. He's a okay. guy from the Isle of Man who's based in Chicago now. So he, he's, he was their American guy when they would tour in America. This is, with, yeah, Jerry McAvoy and Ted McKenna on drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Um, so I have some like family connection with Davy Knowles, like my grandmother who who works in the Isle of Man, knows ah. like a family member of Davy, which is funny because Davy's in America now. But I hooked mm -hmm. up with Davy Knowles, and he's like, "Yeah, come over to the sound check. This is at this place called the Aladdin Theater in Portland here." And yeah, I got to showed up at the sound check. He brought me in the back door before the show. And I got to jam with the band. That was huge for me. I was, I was 15 years old at the time. Oh, wow. And I got yeah. to play cool. um, a replica of, of course, his, I believe it was a 61 Strat, right? That was all beat yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, that, that's another reason for the 61 Strats in my life. Gallagher and Gary Moore is yeah. another of my heroes. And they, they both had 61 Strats. And that, that was the only thing I knew. You know, my heroes play 61 strats and now <laughs> I have mine. Yeah. But this is like, uh, I bought this guitar when I was 17. So, you know, this, this was like the biggest investment ever and it was a good investment. So Yeah, you're still playing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And talk, talking about uh, the Led Zeppelin uh, oh, stuff, yes. do you have different settings or tones that you dial in with the amp or is it just like, you, you stay yourself or did you have to change anything, uh, you know, gear-wise? I don't know. Well, that's a good question because I guess I could say, like, both. I do stay myself and that just happens to fit really well with the Led Zeppelin. So what I do is I use the Vintage channel. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of my go-to channel. That's what I use 99% of the time. I love that Vintage sound. And mm -hmm. what I like to do is hit the front end with a TC Electronic Spark Boost. Mm -hmm. I just really find it shapes the sound really well, gives me lots of, you know, power, sustain. So that is my basic tone. I'll use a, there you go, that's it. Yeah. And I also use a TC Electronic Reverb, the Hall of Fame, and mm -hmm. Flashback, the delay. It's somewhere here. Uh, I have all those uh, pieces here. Ah, flashback is. Yeah, yeah, I can see the flashback. Yeah. And yeah. occasionally yeah, I also use an EP booster from Exotic. Also, yep. either switch between the Spark Booster or the EP Booster. It's for a bit more cleaner sound that I'll use for like the rain song or something. Yeah. But that's my basic I, tone. Yeah, I designed that vintage channel especially having in mind the old school tone, yes. how it was in the old days, like raw amps with the full dynamic. And then it takes pedals well, because then you can feed more signal into that vintage channel, uh, but you can kind of um, create your personal 
spectrum yeah. for that channel in the combination of your guitar, your playing style and that channel. And that's the old school way of thinking. You know, there are some amps out there, they sound great, but they have like a finished recipe. It's like eat it or leave it, you know? Right. And the, that vintage channel is what it is. It can be raw, but you can fine tune it with like any pedal and make it and use that channel to create your own tone more than any other channel on the amp one and even i believe um of course you could have a, a, a pedal on the clean channel as well yeah but then there is more then there is more character of the pedal than of the amp yeah and for me that vintage channel is the center of my universe therefore i don't have a an extra tone for it it's like hey guys this is where you live and you, you can have pedals with it and you can have a clean tone and whatever that's but this is the way how i see the world from my perspective yeah being surrounded by too many marshals in my life <laughs> and um but it's great to see that you found out about that recipe as well and whatever your settings are and whatever your combination is will make you sound uh to your personality yes yeah yeah that's where i live too vintage channel i think i yeah, yeah i usually just have the gain around six so uh -huh. plenty of power but not too much because i'm already feeding it an extra signal with a booster um yeah not too much bass at all jimmy page she i don't i don't think no, you no, pick up the bass very much he he has a a, a rather bright tone yeah uh, and, and and you have to have a lot of um, like clarity from the strings. Yeah. You still need to hear the the metal of the strings in a way. That's where he always lived. And then uh, the the tone needs to be saturated, but not not oversaturated. Yeah. And and that's um, I I love this. I love this kind of um, sound. It, it's it's super inspiring because it's also so dynamic, and you can. You know the way how it feels and the way you you touch the strings makes such a big difference. Yeah, and yeah. but yeah, what I love about the vintage channel too is that yes, it does clean up very well, and you can really get that the character of your guitar. Super cool. Well, you just switch the guitar. This uh, is another Paul Reed Smith. Uh, Paul Reed Smith with uh, what, what are the? Is this kind of the special '57 humbuckers? The other day I was playing a a Paul Reed Smith uh, Orianti um, signature model, yeah. and I was impressed on how great those pickups were. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, fifty-seven oh eight are what these pickups are ah, called. See, yeah. that's are the, these are the pickups that I, I think I love the most in in Paul Reed Smith guitars range. I, I I was blown away by the dynamic and clarity, but still the round tone and the dynamics. Yeah, killer. Yeah. Yeah, they're not super high output. This is sort of designed to be more like a vintage sound. Um, th yeah. yeah, this is the SC fifty-eight. Single cut okay. for the SE, okay, yeah. 58 for yeah. 58 Les Paul. So yeah. this was like a limited run he did back in like 2011 or something. And just his love for 58 Les Pauls. And yeah, follower sold this to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you have been using PRS guitars for like as long as I know you, right? Uh, did you probably become longer. an artist? Uh, probably longer. Uh, I, I th are you an... Paul Reed Smith artist now, I think. I am a, yeah, a Paul Reed, yeah, PRS guitars Pulse artist, which is, yeah, okay. a really great, yeah, sort of endorsement partnership thing. Um, yeah, it's a really great relationship I have with those guys. Um, yeah, I got, you know, a discount at the my local dealer at Five Star Guitars here in Portland. And, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've they actually featured one of my videos last week, which kind of blew it up a little bit. So it was really, really nice yeah. to get that recognition. 
and yep. a couple months ago I did a, a successful collaboration with a fellow uh, p- pulse artist over in Italy. So that was a really mm-hmm. cool collaboration to do. That was for Make Music Day. That was back mm-hmm. in June. So yeah, this has been a yeah really good relationship, opening up opportunities, networking. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy with our guitars, and I'm really happy I get to work with them. Yeah, all, all I can say from my perspective, of course, I love my old strat, but every time I pick up a Paul Reed Smith guitar, I'm blown away by the sheer quality of these guitars. Yeah. In my in my world, they are actually too good. You know, if you play such a shitty old strat, people always think this is the best ever. It is yeah. not. Qu- Quality-wise, the time has changed, and if you if you want to see what what is possible on quality level get a Paul Reed Smith it's yeah. it's unbelievable you, you, you can wherever I go on this planet wherever music shop or whatever I've never had a dodgy uh, PRS guitar I mean it, it's just there's never a quality issue yeah in what I it's like how good these guys are I'm impressed yeah the quality control is insane yeah I actually just ordered a you probably saw a couple videos. I ordered a new guitar just off of Sweetwater and I had full confidence that it would be the best it could be. You're ordering online without ever touching it. I've seen it. I've seen videos of it. Yeah. I might as well show yeah. it here. This is ah, yeah. a really yeah, yeah, cool I guitar. See it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Vela is what it's called. Their S2 series, semi-hollow. Right. I am just in love I with think this guitar. You, 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 you've done some doors uh, licks with, with it the other day, right? I did, yeah. I was did jamming I? on some Roadhouse blues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, talking about blues, I, uh, um, I see that you have uh, blues festivals coming up. There's Waterfront Blues Festival. Uh, or what has this already been? Is this... this has been twice, actually, since ah. I last saw you. Um, but yeah, this okay. is this is a big thing, because um, yeah, definitely the biggest gig I've done. Well, two gigs since I actually did it. Cool. They liked me the first time. They had me the second year. So yeah, this started in. Cool. Well, I started in 2022. I um, you know reached out to the guy. I I I've I'm part of the Cascade Blues Association, which is so the Portland local blues association. And so I reached out to one of the organizers. It's like, hey, I am, you know, up and coming band. I've got the Andrew Matthews band here. If you've got mm-hmm. an opening for me, I'd really like to play at your festival. You know, I'll have a big fun, you know, blues rock show for you. And I actually got on the main stage. There's two main stages. There's like a north stage at the north side of Portland's Waterfront Park and right. the south one. And right. That year it was, if you know Grace Potter, she played that year, and Taj Mahal, just you know, blues royalty. Um, of course. So I was just blown away that I could, I, that was my first time actually being there, and I got to play that huge stage with my band. I was playing like early versions of my original songs there, over a year before wow. I even released the album, um, and this year. Um, over 45,000 attendees overall. It's a four-day festival. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is huge. This is, yeah, Portland Waterfront Park, so it's right on the river that runs through downtown Portland. And, yeah, just tons of people. Huge stages, huge field. Yeah. Um, this and year, um, yeah, Buddy Guy played. Eric Gales, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with wow. that guy. Corey yeah. Wong. And- yeah, all, all the big guys. What what about the International uh, Blues Challenge in Memphis? Oh, what, yeah. Is this coming up or is this also, has this been already? Yeah, so I got um, nominated to go be the youth representative. I was still 19 at the time. I'm 20 now. Um, yeah. So, I yeah, I applied for that. There was sort of a competition thing last year and announced at the Waterfront Blues Festival last year was a youth representative that was going to be sent to Memphis. And that was me. Um, wow. So I, I didn't do the main competition just because I wanted to you know actually go there as the youth representative for Cascade Blues Association. 
And yeah, I got to play in Memphis and um, got to hang around with a, um, a fellow youngster of mine who actually competed at the, uh, yeah, the International Blues Challenge um, set up by the Blues Foundation, International Blues Foundation. And uh, they have these, this huge sort of competition that's held in Memphis, right. Tennessee every January. And so I got yeah. to soak that all in. I got to play in Memphis. There was also a jam down a little bit south in Mississippi, Clarksdale. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a lot of fun. That was like the, the Pacific Northwest people went down to this one jam. It was just mm-hmm. a whole lot of fun. And uh, we actually went down to the crossroads, you know. And w- one of the guys went down on his knees. It was like pouring yeah. rain and just like dark outside. But th- that was a whole lot of fun. Just, yeah, sightseeing, checking out blues, monuments. So, so cool. Hey, if people want to check out your tour dates and your album, where can they go? What's the best way to, you know, where can they grab your album? Where can they see where you are playing live? The easiest thing you can do is go to andrewmatthewslive.com. The first thing you'll see is the big album cover, Trouble Child. You can't miss it. And all you have to do is click on there. You can see, you know, it'll take you to a list of things. You can either stream it on whatever streaming service you want. You can order it through Lightning in a Bottle Records. And you can you can buy it on App, Apple Music, Amazon Music. So that's really easy to get to from my website once you go there, andrewmatthewslive.com. There's other tabs. There. You can see the Performances tab. That's where you will see where I'm performing. And, that's yeah, that's mostly local right now. Um, and actually, cool. actually, I'll probably be going outside a little bit with Valhalla and Led Zeppelin. What these guys do, you know, the Led Zeppelin tribute, they go out in March to Hawaii, and they tour Hawaii every year. And oh, so cool. yeah. that'll be a new experience for me next, yeah, next year in March. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be going. Well, that's not international, but still, it's a long ways. <laughs> Yeah, but cool. This is the way to do it. And I'm waiting for the moment when you come to Europe. Oh, and yeah. I, you know, I, I will introduce you to tons of people in my network. And, hey, but I know how it is. It's, it's such a big step. Me, personally, as a musician, I, I, I had invitations to the States to play with my band, but it was never happening because of the cost situation. Yeah. You have to get things. So I know how hard it is. But the moment you have one spark going, give me a sign and I try to help you because I know how it is to get gigs and uh, whatever I can do, I will do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would love to see you here. Oh, yeah, definitely looking forward to going back to Europe. I went and saw some family in the UK last year and I'm definitely wanting to go again next year. So, yeah, that'd be great to go over to Germany and, yeah, hook up, do whatever. Yeah, that's Super cool. Hey, Andrew, I think that uh, has been a, a cool update for now. We stay in touch. And if there's anything new, let us know and we will get it out on whatever channel we have available um, for you. And uh, of course, there will be an update as soon as there's bigger news. Uh, two years has been a long span. <laughs> yeah, but we did meet last year, actually. You can't forget that in person at the NAMM show. Ah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This was in person. Yeah. Yeah. All good. All good. All good. Yeah. So, hey, thanks for joining in and um, take care. See you soon. All the best. And you guys buy his record. He is killer. And watch the concerts. Yes. It's worth it. Thank you. Great to, ha- <laughs> great to be here again. Thanks for having me, Thomas. Okay. Big, big pleasure for you. Cheers. All right.
today's <laughs> special guest band Mad Max, Daisy Borchardt Hello. and Jürgen. Yeah, and you have been currently on tour yes. um, in South America? Yeah, absolutely. Thomas supported us with his world famous blue guitar M1. M1. Yeah. And we're touring all around the world with this amp and uh, it's really, it's an honor, it's a pleasure and it's always working. Yes. That's the most <laughs> important thing for every musician. Yeah. Whatever circumstances you have and believe me in South America, you get everything. sometimes <laughs> it's yeah. not like in Germany yeah. uh, and these amps <laughs> always work mm. even in 2600 meters height, height yeah. if you're in Bogota. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a dream. Thanks so much. Big, big pleasure, man. Yeah, pleasure for and us. Let us know a little bit about the history of the band because Mad Max is kind of a band going back to the 80s. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, they call it legacy bands. Ah. I, I founded the band in 1982. Wow. Mm -hmm. So last year we have been 40 years yeah, cool. anniversary. Yeah. And uh, we're really happy to be back. Mm -hmm. with our new singer mm -hmm. since two years, Julian mm -hmm. Rohlinger. Yeah. And he's the guy from Saarbrücken. Yeah. So, so that that's makes another meet. connection <laughs> here, okay. to, the, to the Saarland. Yeah. And uh, we're just meeting here, everybody, uh, the whole band, yeah. and writing the songs for the upcoming album, yeah. uh, 2024. And uh, so it was perfect to meet with Thomas here yeah. in the... The Holy Grail venue here. <laughs> <laughs> This is the video studio. Yeah. And uh, yeah, to say thank you and show you a little bit around with the guitars, with the right. M1 and uh, stuff. And yeah, uh, yeah. The, the good the good news I think is like you have a proper band that is uh, actually meeting, like in person. You know, sometimes these I days know, okay. people don't meet anymore. They just send files and. Yeah. And no. you, you don't know if the guy is a smelly one or a good one. Or <laughs> yes, no. So yeah, but I mean that's I think that's our our main USP. Yeah. What they say in these days they say USP. Yeah, USP is like, unique, unique selling, unique selling point. point. Uh, that's a real band yeah. with a history. Yeah. And and real guys and we go out play everywhere in every country all around the world. Yeah. And, and we play the old, mostly the old songs. Of course, a couple of new songs yeah. come into, in, into our set. set list, yeah. But when, when the fans come, like in Spain or South America, wherever, They know of the course, we, yeah, yeah, we have to play the legacy songs like bands like Saxon, yeah. Judas Priest, Iron yeah. Maiden. That's what I grew up with. Yeah. And that was the plan to have a real band. Yeah. No project bands. <laughs> He's doing, he's do, yeah, he is. He is. He's, yeah. he's doing all the solo stuff. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm classic, the songwriter. I'm playing rhythm guitar. Right. Just Rudolf Schenker style. Yeah. A little bit. That's my main, main influence. And uh, yeah, so I, I use basically the same setting and the rest I do with the, the putty yeah, of, the, uh, of, yes, the, the uh, of the guitar. Mm. Just not and um, not to forget our new member of the family, mm -hmm. just not only Thomas oh. and Andreas Kloppmann, of course, yeah. just also Maybach guitars and yeah. Tony Götz, Tony, yeah. who uh, supported me with this wonderful SG guitar. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, I, I ch um, choose uh, the SG guitar because the very first guitar... You ever played? I ever yeah. played, I, I, uh, let's yeah. say, I, where yeah. I have my very first show in yeah. Münster, in, yeah. my, in my hometown, okay. with my very first band, or the Red Gibson SG guitar. Oh, okay. So no, after more than 40 years, I'm returning to, to your, the SG guitar. Yeah, to But of roots. course, not not a, a red one because this That's is too for, much, for Angus. <laughs> too, too much ACDC. So these no yeah, red yeah. SGs. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but but uh, yeah, this is perfect. Yeah. Uh, Freddy Scherer from Gotthard, uh, who's also with uh, Maiva, he's using the white one. Yeah. So I couldn't get a white one. <laughs> And that place I had, is I already to, taken. Yeah, I had to take black. Yeah. You live closer to Kloppmann, like yes. uh, I live in Oldenburg. Oldenburg, Bremen, Kloppen, Bremen. Yeah, it's uh, 30, no, 40, 40 miles. 40, mm -hmm. yeah, miles, kilometers. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, also drive my car. Yeah, <laughs> and you win. <laughs> yeah, half an hour. Yes, yeah, yeah. depending on the traffic, yes, but. Yes. Yeah, so you hang out at Klopmans. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, very often. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if I would live in in that area, I would hang with him a lot too, because he actually 
comes here to my place mm -hmm. uh, also like at least once a year when he goes on his vacation and then we do our test day yes. with uh, yeah. my let's Paul and stuff you know the p guitar projects mm -hmm. that yes. need to to go for next level and mm -hmm. and then and he's also a tone guy you yes. know you, you, you can talk for hours about Switch one cable yeah oh one port. yes yeah, yeah. and then oh, the shielding of the that pole that yes a little, 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 right. little, little yeah, i mean just really for, for us it's really an honor uh klopman uh, yeah. andreas uh, he had uh, did he has his signature klopman pickup, yeah yeah the, the borchardt yeah and i have my signature pickup and uh andreas is doing like advertising in guitar and bass yeah and in guitar yes for and you I mean, guys yeah. in these day, in the yeah. 80s it yeah. was it was normal but yeah. in these days it's super rare getting getting yeah. advertising in print it, magazines it, it's 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 it, just it, normally it's just only for stars yeah 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 for world stars so this is really an honor and uh, andreas if you're watching <laughs> it thanks and so much mm -hmm.